worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. The creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. Once you have spoken, all nature and signs follow the sound of your voice. As you speak, Million creatures catch your breath. Falling in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals the nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every pain in sky a of your grace creation still obeys you so will I so will I the stars were made to worship so will I the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. The oceans roar in greatness, so will I. For everything exists to lift you high, so will I. God of salvation, you chased out my heart for all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to die And as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life So I can find it here if you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every heart design and work of art called love. If you plan to chose surrender, so will I. Praise is so alive. 
In these times of uncertainty and confusion, where anxiety and doubt seem to be the focus for so many, it is so important that we remember we would focus on the greatness of our God, that he is in control, that his wisdom is infinite, his power unlimited, his grace more than sufficient, his love for his children so comforting. Let these next songs that we sing together encourage you to set your minds on the greatness of our God. i 
every morning. It's like a picture that you've painted for me. A love letter in the sky. Story. I could have had a really different story. Down from heaven to restore me, forever save my life. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I live. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Mountains, you're breaking down the weight of all my mountains. Even when it feels like I'm surrounded, you never leave my side. Would you join me in prayer? Father, while we are grateful that this week was not nearly as catastrophic as we thought at one time it might have been, we are very mindful of the tremendous devastation to the western and northern part of our state. Father, we pray for those people as they adjust to a new reality and as they rebuild their lives. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Father, please make us aware of opportunities that we have as a church to be able to render aid and to help those in great need. Father, once again, we are reminded of just how small we are and that there are forces at work of which we have no defense. Father, as we now come to your word, we simply ask that you encourage us with it, you enlighten us with it. And Father, you convict us of its truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I keep reading, and we all know it's true, that this is an unprecedented time for the church. That this is a very challenging set of circumstances for the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe that to be true. It's interesting that I hear people saying, boy, I miss church. And I feel the same way. Boy, I miss church. But when someone says that, what do they mean? What do you mean when you say, I miss church? See, it made me think, what, what is the church? I think many would say it's this building on 4600 Clearview Parkway, this is the church. I think other people might say, well, it's where I go and I meet my friends and a, and a few other nice people. But what does God say? You see, what's the church from God's point of view? He uses so many different metaphors to try to describe what we all call the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones of God. Open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And I, I just want to give you a glimpse just into Ephesians and what Paul tells the church of Ephesus, what the church is. He says in verse 22, he said he put all things in subjection under his feet and he gave him, he said, as head over all things, he said to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's not the only time. He calls the church is the body of Christ. And we know when Paul speaks to the Corinthians, he tells us, and Christ is the head. So Christ is the head, and the church is the body. Now, I mean, one implication out of that as clear as possible, the head decides what the church does, and the body does what the head says. The church should act just like your body acts. Your brain controls what you do, and then your body just simply reacts to it. Secondly, though, what he ends up doing is, if you look at chapter 2, and verse 19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. There's another metaphor. What is the church? We're God's household. What an interesting way to say it. He's our father, we're his children, and we're the household of God. Notice he gets down to verse 21 and 22 of the same chapter and says, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together, he said, into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. Here he says we're the temple of God. Now, individually, Christians are the temple of God. Collectively, the church is the temple or the residency of God. Then if you go to chapter 5 of Corinthians, verse 28, he uses an analogy, and he says this, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. 
This is interesting. Down in verse 32, he said, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Here is inference, and it's very clear in the book of Revelation, that the church is the bride of Christ. We're the bride. We're, so when you think about it, we're of the household of God. We're the temple of God. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're part of God's household. That's just in this book. Peter says that uh, we're the flock of God and we're the pillar of truth. Hmm. But nowhere in the entire New Testament, nowhere is the church ever called a building. Never is the church called a building. You see, I think we have to be careful. I think we end up in times like this that our mantra becomes, I want to go to church. And I do too. I want you to go to church. But I have to be careful with that. You're not to say, I want to go to church. What you should say is, we are the church. We are the church. Not, I go to church. That's such an important thing for us to understand because we've been forced to understand it by the circumstances of our day. Hmm. My inference is clear to me. We never stop being the church. We never stop being the household of God, the bride of Christ. We never stop. We are the church. And I'm afraid that some people and maybe some of you, but some people have thought, well, gee, if we can't go to church, well, then I can be sort of on vacation from church. I can kind of be on vacation. You know, we don't have to go, so I can sort of vacate. I'm telling you, that is not only unbiblical, that's dangerous. You never stop being the church. God's expectations of you and I never cease because we are the church. Hmm. We can't do this. In fact, I want to argue today that the circumstances we're under right now since this whole pandemic began may simply be the greatest opportunity that all churches, and specifically our churches, ever had to be the church. You see, I think all of us sort of get into that mindset that I just simply go to church. Not every week, but most weeks. You see, and I've done my duty. I've gone to church. God has given us a unique opportunity. So I want to review just a little for some of you. But for the others of you, I want to make something clear. What does the church actually, how does the church actually function? What should it be doing? So I want you to go to Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Now, please remember that Acts 2 is where the church began. That's Pentecost. This is when the church began. And so right in the beginning, God gives us a clear statement as to how does a church function. Right from the beginning, he wants to make this clear. It says in verse 41, So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls in Jerusalem that the church is born in. And now you're going to see what does it function like. Now please understand one thing that we know for certain that it doesn't have at Pentecost. There's no building. Okay. In fact, there's no real building for the church for about 350 years. So... Here we see it. He says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. In the 1970s, Gene Getz wrote a book called Sharpening the Focus of the Church. It's a wonderful book. It, it's actually the book that's the philosophical base of our church. Gene wrote this book so that we understand church better. And what he said in the book was that Every church must have three vital experiences. 
It must. It must have three functions that are not negotiable. These are functions that the church has to have all the time. And so the very first one that he says is right there in that verse. The first function, the first vital experience is learning. He said they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching right from the beginning. And understand how important this is. What do they have? Old Testament. Who are they? Messianic Jews. Do they have any understanding of the church at all? No. Who has to tell them? The apostles. That's the way this works. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. It's interesting that in the Great Commission, Jesus Christ says, go and make disciples, right? Baptizing, right? And teaching. The dasko is the word. It's used a hundred times in the New Testament. It means teaching. You have to be learning. Someone has to be teaching. Hmm. What a great time this is to be taught. What an unprecedented time. Think of how much time many of us have on our hands. Now, I do understand healthcare professionals, a lot of people, they're working around the clock. I get that. But for a lot of us, there's a lot of time. And you keep hearing the pundits on TV talking about how lonely people are. You know, it's just so sad. And I'm so isolated. And what do I do with my time? Well, a lot of people have a lot of different ways of trying to cope with that, most of which are not good. But for a Christian, what a time. What a time to learn. What a time to be taught. I mean, we live in not just a time of the pandemic, we live in a time of technology. Golly, you can find almost every single great teacher in Christendom online. All teaching. All you have to do is avail yourself of it if you want to. You can, sp you can read books online. You don't even have to go to a library. You don't have to buy the book. You can read a book online. The question I have was, are you taking advantage of that? Or are you on vacation from church? A couple weeks ago, we had Kent and Marion Fuller here. And uh, we explained that their circumstances are very unusual because they got caught here in New Orleans. They're Belizeans. And they can't go back to Belize even yet. So what are they going to do with all their time? Well, I can tell you this. From the beginning on, Kent comes to me and says, do you have some books for me to read? And I started getting him three to five books at a time. As soon as he finishes, he brings them back. He said, do you have some more books for me to read? And I give them again. He's probably read more books since he's been here than any other period of time over a long period of time because he has the time. What an advantage. The question I have for you, are you doing that? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? You see, are you using this time for you to learn more of the truth from the Word of God? If you don't, you're missing a tremendous opportunity. Remember, Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Hmm. The Lord's given us this opportunity to grow. You see, if the only time you have ever been in the Bible is that on most Sundays you show up in church and listen to someone like me talk, you're not, you're not growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. You're not a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. You see, we have a responsibility here. It's an important thing. It's Peter says, like newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word. It feeds us. And what an opportunity we have right now to be fed in so many ways. The second vital experience is the vital relational experience. Notice again, he says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's our name. Fellowship. Wow. Down in verse 44, he describes it. He said, and all those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. Don't miss that verse. Because I don't know if you think fellowship is what it is. 
This is the word koinonia. This is a word that means partnership. They had all things in common. They were all for one and one for all. They sustained each other financially, physically. That's fellowship. I hear people say, and sometimes I feel the same way, boy, I, I really miss the fellowship on Sunday morning. <laughs> I don't want to burst your bubble, but very unlikely that that's fellowship. You see, when I meet my friends or a few other people that I know and say good morning and I say to my friends, you see the game on Saturday? Holy cow, was that something or what? That's not fellowship. No, that's friendship. I'm all for friendship. But that's not fellowship. Fellowship is partnership. <laughs> How does it work in our lives? Well, look at all the one another's in the New Testament. Someone has written her 39 different ones. One another's. That's fellowship. Love one another. Encourage one another. Serve one another. Admonish one another. Confess your sins to one another. Forgive one another. On and on you have these one another's. That's fellowship. You see, and how much of that is what we do on Sunday morning? Hmm. Again, during this pandemic, don't we have unique opportunities? Just unique opportunities here for fellowship. Do people have needs? Some people lost their jobs. Are people lonely? Yes. What are you doing about that? What are you doing about that? How have you showed people, your brothers and sisters in Christ, that you love them, that you're serving them, you pray for them? What do you do for fellowship? And I'm not sure many of us do anything. But we all want to say, but I really miss it. I know you miss something. Go with me to Romans chapter 12. I love what Paul writes here. Romans 12, verse 10. Paul gives us another little description here of fellowship. He starts out and he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Can someone come to your mind right now in the body of Christ that you say, I'm devoted to them? I want to demonstrate my love for them. That's what Paul said. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Why should I be devoted to you? Because you're more important than me. That's what Paul said to the Philippians. Consider everyone else as more important than yourself. Be devoted to one another. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. you got to work at this. This takes time and effort. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Isn't that exactly what we're all doing right now? One of the greatest opportunities you have in the church for fellowship is during tribulation. Because when I am tribulating, I don't know if that's a word, when I am tribulating, I need encouraged. I need someone to lift me up. I need those people. And we have people right now who are in tribulation. And you say, I want fellowship. Well, then with all diligence, show them the honor that's due them. Devoted in prayer. What's well, an important thing? This is a discipline that's difficult for us. Isn't it easy to be in prayer for yourself? Do you ever find that pretty easy? Oh, God, help me get through this day. Oh, God, when you have that diagnosis go away. Oh, oh God. But what about... 
intercessory prayer for others. How much time do you spend praying for others? You see, I think we've reconfigured this whole word fellowship. And so we don't see our responsibility here. He said, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Wow. That's fellowship. You have a need. If I have the resources, I'll meet your need. This is hard for us. Fellowship requires you to be wholly other-oriented. And if we're all honest with ourselves, aren't we just a little bit myopic and selfish? So it's a lot easier for us to call fellowship. Fellowship's just seeing my friends on Sunday morning talking about yesterday's game. And once in a while in some churches, maybe we could have a donut and coffee. There we go. It's fellowship now. That's not what the Bible says at all. That's not fellowship. That's friendship. And I'm all for friendship. But don't call it fellowship. Don't call it what God does. Hmm. Go with me to 1 Peter for a moment. Verse 7. In chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 7. Notice Peter picks right up where Paul left off. He says in verse 7, and this may apply for today for all we know, the end of all things is near. Well, we know it's nearer than it was yesterday. The end of all things is near. I mean, I've even been asked that question. Pastor, do you think what's going on globally right now with all the, is this, do you think this is part of the end times? The answer is pretty simple. Yes, I do. But I don't know if that means anything. Because the New Testament writers believe they're part of the end times. The end times is a long time. But here Peter says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Let's pray about this. He says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. There it is again. Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. The inference there is kind of funny when you think about it. The more you know people, the more they impress you or the more they depress you. Really. You know, sometimes you you think almost, boy, I, I wish I hadn't got to know that person that well. Because all of us fall short of the glory of God. And he says, yeah. He said, I understand that it's sin there, but you know, if you have a fervent love for somebody, you can cover a multitude of sins. You see, because God loved me so much that what what has he done for me? He forgives me. So if I have a fervent love for you, what do I do for you? I forgive you. That's what Peter says. Then he says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. (laughs) That's just funny to me. Show hospitality to people without complaint. I wish he wouldn't have said that part. It's sort of like this. You you say to your spouse, hey, hon, you know, so-and-so, they're coming over for the evening. Oh, boy. I hope I'm up to it. (laughs) And and they got their kids. Yeah, I think, oh, boy. (laughs) You see, that's what we start thinking We start thinking, and he says, no, no, that's not real hospitality. That's almost like dutiful hospitality. i got to do this. He said, no, do it without complaining. He said, be hospitable without, he said, any sense of complaint. He said, that each one of you has received a special gift, employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifest, manifest grace of God. God says, look, the gifts I've given you aren't just for you. The gifts I've given you are for others. You serve them with the gift I give you. Boy, that is fellowship. That's so different than what we often think. Now go with me back to Acts chapter 2 again for just a moment. 
because this vital relational experience horizontally is called fellowship. But vertically, it's called what? Worship. That's what it is. It's worship. And not only do we have very strange ideas about fellowship, but we often, in the context of a local body of believers, have strange ideas about worship as well. Notice, it just comes up as an inference right in the beginning of verse 47 of chapter 2. He says, praising God. That's what they're doing. They're praising God. What is worship? Praise. I'm praising God. Notice, it doesn't say they did it only on Sunday morning. It doesn't say they did it in a building. It says here they were just praising God. You see, it's a present tense. They continued to just praise God. Present tense worship is what you and I should be all about. You should wake up worshiping God. You should spend your day worshiping God and go to bed worshiping God. You've heard me say this in the past here. When it comes to corporate worship, if you didn't bring it, you didn't do it. You don't go somewhere and then be stimulated so you can worship. Your heart either worships God or it doesn't. You see, that's a different thing. Worship is part of who we are. I say, after worshiping God all week long individually, we come together collectively and we worship God. <laughs> Many in the contemporary church, they often fall into the trap that the key element to worship God is how good can you make the music? How good can it be and how emotional? And especially if you can do it with lighting and special effects. So if you use a lot of special effects and a lot of music in a certain way, then you can get people to worship. Doesn't occur there. Now what happens is, when you do that, once you create a concert-like atmosphere and get people engaged, there's something that happens to them. They can't help it. They become the audience. I still remember years ago, I just read this, and a person came up to the pastor of the church and said, you know, I didn't get much out of worship today. <laughs> he said, that's good because we weren't worshiping you. You see what happens when you're the audience? Well, that wasn't good enough for me. That didn't grip me. That, that, wow, you're not the audience. God's the audience. And he sees only your heart. This means nothing to him. Whether what the lighting is, the quality, that doesn't mean anything to him. He means, does this stimulate your heart? It's not only that you sing true words, because that's important, but that you believe what you're singing. You see, I can't just sing the words. I've got to believe what I'm saying. That becomes such an important thing. <laughs> Singing's important. It's very important. The context might be a little bit different in the Bible than we think of it because we've made it simply a Sunday morning church activity. But the night before Jesus was crucified, after he was in the upper room, he, the last thing they did when they left the upper room to go to the Mount Gethsemane was they sang. They sang together. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He also wrote to the Colossians, singing with thankfulness in your heart. But the point of it is, singing a great praise song without real thankfulness in your real heart is just a waste of time. Because that's not what God's interested in. He's only interested in your heart. <clears throat> There's another experience. He says that in verse 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Vital witnessing experience. The Lord wasn't just magically adding to their number. These people were praising God, and they were witnessing for Jesus Christ. And men and women and boys and girls came to a saving faith of Jesus Christ, and that's how God added to their number. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission.
These are great words, famous words. And verse 18 says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, which means people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's it. Now, so often we see too many commands here. There's, there's only one. There's only one command in the Great Commission. Make disciples. That's the command. There are three participles that describe how you go and make disciples. One, by going. Two, by baptizing. That means witnessing to them. They come to a saving knowledge of Christ and are baptized. Or they baptize in the Spirit of God. Either way. But baptizing is, is a sign of salvation for them. And then he says, and teaching them everything I taught you. We're right back to where we started, the vital learning experience. You have to be taught. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean I have spiritual knowledge. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean I'm going to be conformed to the image of Christ. I need to be taught that. Hmm. How do we do this? You see, it's, it's essential to us. The book of Acts starts out in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, you are my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the world. We are the church, and we are God's plan. That's us. That's your job. That's my job. You witness. Now, please understand, it's a simple way to understand it. What does a witness do? They testify. And what do they testify? What they know to be true. He said, yeah, that's, that's you and me. You're my witness. You are my witness. What do I tell people? Tell them what you know. Tell them what Christ means to you. Tell them how you became a Christian. I've said this over the years, but I'm always befuddled when people will say to me, you should have been there. I mean, why would I be there? Well, but you could argue about dinosaurs or astrophysics better than I can. That's not what a witness does. Could you imagine you witness something, they ask you to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and he says, now what do you understand about nuclear physics or astrophysics? Tell me your understanding. Well, that'd be a short testimony, wouldn't it? Zero. I don't have a testimony. Jesus said, no, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to tell people what you've experienced. I love what Peter writes. Peter said, we are to give an account for the hope that's in us. How do you think a lot of people in our culture feel right now? Hopeless. Hopeless. Lost their jobs. Lost their, all their financial security. Some people have lost their lives. Some people are terrified of losing their lives. I mean, there's a lot of despair out there right now. I mean, it's an amazing thing that you get secular people, even through the media, keep telling us that one of the ongoing biggest issues of the entire pandemic is the mental health of Americans. Americans are struggling with their mental health. Why? Fearful. They feel fear. They feel hopeless. They're depressed. They feel unhappy. And here we are. What an opportunity God has given us. What a uniquely different opportunity to give an account for the hope that's in you. You're fearful. I have peace. What? I have peace. How can you have peace in a time like this? I can just tell them about my Lord. I feel so hopeless. I have hope. How can you have hope? Because I read the end of the book, we win. Because the worst thing that could happen to me can't happen to me. I have hope. Well, I'm so miserable. I have joy. Can you see how that would testify to the culture we live in? But not a foreign vacation. You know, because I, I miss going to church. 
we have to be very, very careful. Vital learning experience, vital relational experience, horizontally fellowship, vertically worship, and a vital witnessing experience. That's what God says, that is what the church does. We don't go to church. We are the church. Let's pray. Father, it seems to me that for all of us, it's so easy to get distracted. We often focus on what we don't have anymore instead of these great opportunities that we do have. For some of us, Father, we spend all of our time complaining about what we don't have instead of being about the business about what we do have. Father, these are extraordinary circumstances. They are unique to us as a people, but they are also a tremendous opportunity for your church. And so I pray, Father, for our church, for our people, that they look at what the Bible tells them they are to be, and through your power, of your spirit, we become what you want us to be. What an impact we can make on the lives of those around us. That's my prayer, Father, for all of us. In Jesus' magnificent name, amen.
now may we be encouraged to go and be the church. Amen. Amen.